Well, good afternoon, First Baptist Oakboro family and friends. I am Jonathan Waits, and I have the great privilege of serving as pastor of this amazing community of people. If you are connecting with us this afternoon, I want you to know that you are in the midst of a people with whom you can connect to grow in Christ and reach out for his kingdom. We would just be delighted if you would join us and take the leap and engage with us just a little bit more fully by attending one of our live in-person Sunday services now at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. You can go to our website or on the Facebook page right there at the top of it. There's a link that you can sign up for your service. We would love to be able to see you in person then, but for now, I am thrilled to be able to see you digitally this afternoon. As for this afternoon, we are going to continue our journey through Paul's first letter to the church in ancient Corinth uh, by finishing off the rest of chapter 12. And I've got to tell you, I have been excited about this set of material, about, about what we're talking about today for quite some time. What Paul has to say here that we're going to look at now is so important in terms of shaping how we think about doing church together. Now, whether you are a part of this church or part of another church, what Paul says here has to be taken into account when you think about who does what in the church and how much that matters. As we established last week, the church works best when every part plays its part. What we're going to do together today is clarify just how much each part matters. Spoiler alert, it's a lot. I hope you're ready for this because this is going to be some good stuff. I'm going to start by just reading the rest of the chapter. We stop at verse 11. I'll pick up at verse 12, and then we'll kind of break it down a bit from there. And listen to this carefully because there's some really good stuff here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, is it not for that reason any less a part of the body? If the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, is it not for that reason any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body we consider less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do, do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in other tongues? Do all interpret? But desire the greater gifts. And I will show you an even better way. Okay, so right out of the gate here, if you have reactions to what I just read, I want you to put them there in the comment section on the video, and we will engage in those together as the week goes. But, but think about this one for a minute. What did we see Paul saying last time? Remember that? He was talking about the fact that although there are many different gifts in the body of Christ, spiritual gifts, uh, that, that is in the church, they are of equal importance because they all originate from the same source, Jesus. Here, we see Paul starting out by stating this truth in yet another way, right? But here he's beginning to explore in more detail just what it means that we're all a part of the body of Christ. And he sees a natural illustration here in the human body. This illustration really controls the rest of the chapter. Paul here in verse 12 compares the body of Christ to your body and mine. 
Now, the human body has many different parts, all performing different functions at different times and in different ways. The brain and the foot don't look anything alike. They could not be more different in almost every respect. The stirrup bone in the ear, the, the smallest bone in the body, has almost nothing in common with the femur, the largest, strongest bone in the body. The femur supports the weight of the whole body, while all the, the, the stirrup bone does is allow vibrations to pass from one place to another. Without the femur, the whole body would be functionally immobile, unable to do anything without help. Without the stirrup bone, you just don't hear as effectively or at all. But, you know, that's one ear. Take out one of those, you're fine. Nonetheless, the body is still one single body, and thus all of the parts, disparate in form and function as they may be, are held together by a unity that's greater than the sum of the whole. And the same thing is true of the church. And, and notice a couple of things here. The whole idea here assumes, it assumes that there will be variety in the body of Christ. It assumes that. The church was never intended to be a group where all the people look and act and think and speak alike. This is just like the world doesn't all look the same, right? From person to person or place to place. In this way, the church is designed to reflect the world, but to reflect it in a way that shows it what it could be, not simply what it is. And this points us to the second thing to notice. The differences among the body of Christ don't lose their distinctiveness, even though they're held together by a unity that's greater than they are individually. In other words, even though they are held together as one, they don't lose their individuality. This is a point at which the church positively diverges from the world around us. The only way the world knows how to do unity is to force everyone into conformity. Right? We can't be truly united until we're all alike. This is the cry of future tyrants everywhere. Right? And where we aren't alike, and we see this today all over the place, we're hopelessly divided, it seems. Only the church has the power to point to something different from this when we get it right. Which is why it's so important for us to get it right. When we get this unity among diversity right in the church, we offer to the world outside our walls a picture of how things should work. Right? When we're divided, though, and merely reflect the world in this sense, we don't contribute anything but more noise to the unbearable cacophony already pelting around us. And why are we so united in the church in Christ? That's what Paul hits on in verse 13 there. We're all baptized by one spirit into one body, Paul says. Well, what's that mean? Well, it means we all had to come in the same door to get in. Entrance into the church, into the kingdom of God, is the same for every single person who comes in. It doesn't matter anything else about them, right? We are all here because of grace rooted in faith, period. No one is here because of something inherent to them, some natural advantage that might play to their benefit, that might play to their benefit in the world outside the church. As the old saying goes, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And because we all received grace alone through faith, none of us brings anything to the church that God somehow needed more than he needed someone else. Every single gift matters. Every person matters. The church works best when every part plays its part. And all of those parts are important to the symphony sound in the way it was designed. And Paul goes on here to specifically mention some different groups of people in the church. In, in his day, these were some of the primary lines of social division. Jews and Greeks were sharply divided one from another. Uh, Greeks thought the Jews were bizarre, while the Jews thought the Greeks were barbaric. And whether one was slave or free made a huge difference socially. So then, why does Paul mention all these different groups? Is it to say they're all really the same? No, again. The point here is not that we should somehow look to erase distinctions. Rather, our natural distinctions don't give us any advantage over anyone else in the church. God can achieve the advance of his kingdom through a Greek just as well as a Jew. He can do it whether the person is a slave or a freeman. The black person has just as important a role to play in the kingdom of God as the white or brown or yellow or red or whatever other color you want to choose. This doesn't mean the color doesn't matter but it doesn't affect their standing in the church or the importance of their contribution to the kingdom. There's one spirit who gives us entrance and one spirit who sustains and nourishes us once we're in. Rich people in Paul's day, and frankly our day as well, could eat better food than poor people. Poor people had to shop at bargain grocery stores. Rich people shop at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. 
In the church, though, we're all nourished from the same Spirit. Once again, everyone is on an equal footing. So then, that gets us through 12 and 13. Paul's been jamming then on the fact for a little while now that every part of the body is united in Christ. There's just one body in spite of its many parts. At verse 14, though, he shifts gears and begins driving in the other direction. You see, although the unity in the body is really, really important, just like we've been saying, that unity doesn't take away the distinctiveness of each individual part. You see, if, if we're not careful in our effort to drive home the point of unity, we can leave some parts feeling like, well, they, they don't really matter. Right? It really is the big and important parts that everybody sees that matter most. Well, if Paul spent just that little bit of time we've talked about just today, talking about talking folks who feel that they might fit into the category of big and important down, he spends a whole lot more time now talking up folks who feel that they don't really matter to the body. And this is where things start to get really good. You ready? Again, then Paul starts out with this in verse 14. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. Now, that's, that's true, of course. The human body has more than 7,500 named parts. You can go find an anatomy book and check me on that if you'd like. Maybe a few more, maybe a few less, but somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, but if you want to get really technical, the body has over 100 trillion cells. There's 100 trillion parts plus. One body, many, 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 dot, 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 many parts. And here's the thing. All of those parts do something. They do something without which the body won't be complete. Okay, but what about the parts that the body can live without? I mean, people have surgeries all the time to remove parts that have gone bad. I don't have my tonsils or my uvula or my appendix. They're all gone. And I'm as healthy as I can be. In fact, I'm probably healthier now than I was when I had it. Well, two responses for that. First, don't push the analogy too far. These are intended to make a general point, not to be exactly correct at every single turn, scientifically speaking. Second, though, because we live in a sin-broken world, sometimes parts of the body of Christ go so bad that they have to be removed for the sake of the whole body. That's unfailingly a tragedy in a situation that should never be sought out by a church and should only be entered into with a great deal of prayerful caution. But it does happen. That aside, though, the fact is that we have a tendency to bring worldly thinking about gifts into the church with us when we come. And worldly thinking about gifts and on their relative importance holds that even though we might be united by some larger force, some gifts really are more important than others. Right? Gifts that are out front and visible are really the ones that matter most. I mean, without the CEO steering the ship, it's just going to sail off into the abyss. Some gifts really are necessary to the body, and well, some, they just aren't. Now, that may, be how we, that may be how the world thinks, but let's talk about how things really work. If the foot should say, Paul writes, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong for the, to the body, is it for that reason any less a part of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, and therefore I don't belong to the body, is it not for that reason any less a part of the body? Now, what's Paul getting at here? Well, he's speaking directly to those folks in the church who feel like they have gifts that seem like they shouldn't be as important to others because of a, a lack of attention or obvious importance. Well, think about what some of those gifts might be. How about the person who sets up chairs for worship? If that job is done right, nobody notices it. It just happens. How about the person who arrives early to unlock the building? You ever thought about that? You go to church and the doors are just unlocked. Somebody had to unlock them. How about the person who mows the grass? You notice when it's not mowed, but when it is mowed, it's just there, right? How about the one who cleans the toilets during the week? These and other gifts in the same kind of vein can easily be construed by the folks who have them and the folks who are used to their happening without their notice as being less important to the overall functioning of the church than, say, gifts that involve leading worship or teaching Sunday school or preaching. Well, Paul says this, You may be one thing and not another, and your thing may not seem like it matters a whole lot. But just because you don't have the same gift as somebody else doesn't mean you are therefore less a part of the body. In other words, you still matter. A lot. 
From here, then, Paul invites us to imagine a world in which everyone did have the same gifts, right? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Do you see it? If the body doesn't have all the parts functioning as they were designed to function, it's less than it would be without them firmly in place. More than that, a body composed of a single part, it would not shine, therefore, all the brighter because of that. It would be an abomination. I mean, let's go ahead and push the analogy here a little bit. If the whole body were an eye, it would be a monster. Right? I mean, can you imagine a giant eyeball walking or, I guess, rolling, and somebody would have to push it because it couldn't propel itself, rolling down the street? Gross! Or can you imagine if the whole body was just a, a giant ear? I mean, I know I've got big ears, but I'm talking like whole body ear. Picture it in your mind. Disgusting. Imagine how much wax that would be, that would, that would be created. Gross! It'd be awful. But not to mention that you'd have to be carried everywhere then. You know, a 160-pound ear. Who's going to do something with that? You couldn't think, you couldn't eat, you couldn't feel. You'd just be an ear or, or an eye, and you'd be worthless. You'd be a gigantic, ugly paperweight. The body needs all of its parts. And God knows this, too. See, I think verse 18 here, the next verse, is, is not only my favorite verse in this passage, it's one of my favorite verses in the whole of the scriptures in terms of how we should think about the church. Listen to this again. But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. Now, this, this applies at two levels. Let's take the physical first. God's design of the human body is breathtakingly beautiful. Right? It all works. It works in ways and at a level that we don't even fully understand yet. Everything about nature suggests the body should just fall apart. We defy some basic laws of physics. We don't go back to entropy. We just keep re renewing ourselves as we go. And eventually, over time, we do. But the body works. It just keeps working in this perfect harmony that we can only marvel at and do our best to replicate. God arranged each of the parts just as he wanted. Now let's talk about the spiritual in the church. If you are a follower of Jesus and a part of the church, you've been put there specifically by God because he wants your gifts in that church at that time. He knows that the community needs the contribution that you bring to the table. They won't be able to fully accomplish what he designed them to accomplish without you. Think about what this means because it's a big deal. You matter to the church. No matter who you are, how you serve, what gifts you bring to the table, you matter. There are no unimportant spiritual gifts. Listen to this well. People will go to a church without a preacher. They won't go to a church long that has nasty toilets. I'm just saying. They will go to a church where there is not a preacher preaching every Sunday and stay there for quite a while. But if there are nasty toilets, they are not going to come back. The church works best when every part plays its part. Here, though, Paul actually shifts gears back one more time. He leans back in the other direction. And before we unpack that, why do you think he does this? Why, why this shifting back and forth? Well, it's because the church itself does this. Paul is tottering back and forth between two extremes, like a father running behind a child who's learning to ride a bike. Right, he leans a little bit one way, and Dad gently pushes it back to the middle. And then he leans a little bit the other way, and Dad gently pushes it back to the middle. The, the church does the same kind of thing on the very issue that we're talking about. We lean in the direction of highlighting some gifts at the expense of others, and then we lean in the direction uh, of trying to say, well, all gifts are, are, are exactly the same, as if one is interchangeable for another. Right? And so Paul reminds us that, yes, we're unified, but yes, the variety really does matter. Part of being in the church, part of following Jesus, is learning to walk in the kingdom. And as far as the kingdom is concerned, we're all infants, still learning to toddle on our own two feet, but learning, too, that we can't toddle anywhere without the gravity of the Father enabling us to do it. But we have to remember all the time that the Christian life, it's, it's lived on the blade of a knife. To lean too far in another direction means to fall. In any event, to, the, to those who might start to think, well, that their gifts really do matter more than the rest, Paul says this, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. One part may be strong, and its contribution might be profound, but none of us exist on our own. 
Right? None of us exist for or by ourselves. We need each other badly. As a matter of fact, the parts that seem the weakest and the most insignificant are the ones that we want to cherish the most because their contribution actually can form the foundation on which the more flashy parts reside. When we think about other members of the body of Christ, our first thoughts should be framed by gratitude. Right? I am so glad that they're here and doing what they do because I couldn't do what I do without them. God was right to put them here. There are parts of your body Think about this. There are parts of your body that nobody sees until the relationship between you and them is intimate. The church is kind of like that, too. There are parts that everybody's going to see immediately. Eyes, head, hands, ears, right? Seem to stand out the most. But just because some other parts aren't seen first and foremost doesn't mean that they aren't still of a superlative importance to the healthy functioning of the body as a whole. And so we show those parts greater honor and respect, Paul says. We cherish them and we guard their contribution carefully, jealously, knowing that we won't be ourselves without them. And here's the thing. God designed the body to work like this, with some parts more visible and others less visible, but no less important, and even arguably more important. He designed it on purpose like this. And we see this in the second half of verse 24. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honorable honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. God designed us to work like this, right? so that the members would hang tightly to one another. We need each other. God wanted us to understand that. He knew that without this, our sinful pride would just drive us apart. It would rip, rip us into pieces. We would fragment and fall apart. So he baked right into the cake a need for this kind of cohesion. We can't make it without it. And at the same time, the more we stay on track with it, the more we naturally desire it. The result of this is just as Paul outlines starting in, verse, in the rest of verse 25. When your body suffers, when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers with it, right? When, when one part of your body hurts, your whole body hurts. When you have a headache, it's not just that your head hurts, it's that all of you is suffering. It's because the body is a unified whole. Well, the same goes with the body of Christ. When one part of the body is suffering, we should all be suffering with him or her. Now, whether or not we actually do that is another matter entirely, but, but if we don't, where we don't, it's because we don't understand what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. We're not fully functioning as a part of the body of Christ just yet. That's why teaching like this is so important to make sure we understand. At the same time, though, on the other side, if part of the body is honored, we all share in the honor. It's because no single part operates on its own. If we accomplish anything as a body, we accomplish it as a body. We can rejoice in the successes and honor all together. At last then, with all of this in mind, Paul closes out the chapter by racing out of left field and broadsiding this with something that seems totally to, to totally contradict everything else we've been talking about. Listen to these last few verses one more time. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, Second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongue. And then he asks all those questions. In the words of a wise man, huh? I thought all the gifts were on an equal footing with one another. Why, why, why does Paul not tell us that there's an order to them? I mean, if God gives some gifts before others, that means they're more important than the ones to follow, follow right? Not so fast. Paul is, believe it or not, Staying perfectly consistent here with everything else he's been saying. What he offers here is not an ordering in terms of importance, uh, but an ordering of gifts as they are necessary in starting the church, in the functioning of the church. Indeed, these were necessary to start the church, period. Apostles are people who start new things. They are sent by God to begin new works. you got to have an apostle in order to start a new work. Having somebody around to clean the toilets doesn't do any good if there are no toilets to be cleaned. Now, that doesn't mean the one cleaning the toilets is any less important than the one who plants the church, and indeed the one who plants the church is often the one who cleans the toilets for a while at first. But the church has to be planted before there will be toilets to clean. There's an ordering then. It's a sequence, not a rank. The other gift that Paul mentions here falls similarly in line with that. And in the second part of this little section where Paul asks those questions, he, he swings back in the other direction. No one person has all these gifts. 
we've talked before about the fact that in English, if you ask a rhetorical question, you kind of got to rely on context cues and body language in order to know whether the intended answer is yes or no. Greek's not like that. Greek, they have a word, a particle, may, specifically pronounced, it's often spelled like me, but it's pronounced may. But when you see that word in a sentence that's a question, it assumes the answer to the question is no. Well, that appears in every one of these little questions that Paul asks. His point here then becomes abundantly clear. No one person has all of these gifts. Everybody doesn't have each one of these gifts either. Right? All of these gifts are ultimately important and necessary in starting the church. And because no one person has them all, every person becomes all the more important. In other words, the church works best when every part plays its part. And as for the note there right at the end about desiring greater gifts, Paul finally offers a bit of worldly reality for us to end with. We want to have certain gifts. That's natural, right? We want to, we want to have the ones that come with more pomp and circumstance. We, we want that. And Paul says it's okay to want that. Right? That's normal. That's natural. The implication from the broader chapter, though, is that ultimately God gives us the gifts that he does because he wants us to have those. He does it on purpose. He has a plan for us. Remember verse 18? Each gift, person, is put in that place on purpose. No one person or part is more important than any other. But while we're thinking about desiring greater gifts, Paul has some advice for us on that that we'll talk about next time. In the end, then, what stands out? Simply this. The church works best when every part plays its part. That's how we were designed to work. When we get our hearts and minds wrapped around that fully, nothing will be impossible for us. No force will be able to stand against us. We are stronger together. The things we will manage to accomplish on our own will be far outshined by those that we accomplish as a body. We won't even be close. But we need every single part of the body in order to do it. The church works best when every part plays its part. If you are a part of the church then, we need you. If it's not this church, your church needs you. You matter. We can't make it without you. And when you make your full contribution, God gets the glory, you get the joy, and the kingdom gets expanded. Let's work together then, all of us, to see that kingdom advance. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you designed such incredible diversity into the body of Christ. But in spite of that diversity, we're still united in Christ. Help us as a church as your followers, get our hearts and minds wrapped around this incredibly important truth. Give us a sense of gratitude for folks who are different from us, yet never let us feel like we don't matter. Let us find our identity first and foremost in you, in whom we matter infinitely. Shape this church so that we can truly be a place where anyone can connect. Grow in Christ and reach out for his kingdom. Lead us forward faithfully in that so that we might reflect you more. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I can't wait to see you in person on Sunday as we continue our journey through Acts. And as a treat this week, Nate is going to be bringing the sermon. You will not want to miss that. We'll see you then.